Hi everyone, this is going to be the fourth video on the topic of bioenergetics for advanced level biology. In this video we're going to start our discussion of the process of respiration by looking at the first stage of respiration, which is glycolysis. So let's begin by looking at the origin and the significance of this process of glycolysis. Now, this process is one of the many basic metabolic pathways which is actually common to all, li uh, all living organisms. And it takes place in the cytoplasm, in the cytosol of cells. And it has a central role in uh, respiration, but also in general metabolism. Now, this suggests that glycolysis evolved early in the history of life because it is common to all living organisms, prokaryotes and eukaryotes. If you recall, the single biggest difference between the structure of eukaryotes and prokaryotes is that prokaryotes do not have internal membrane-bound organelles the way that eukaryotic cells do. In eukaryotic cells at GCSE level, you are perhaps taught that respiration is a process which occurs exclusively in the mitochondria. Now, that's not actually the case. It is the aerobic parts of respiration which occurs in the mitochondria and the anaerobic parts of respiration which occurs in the cytoplasm. So as such, uh, prokaryotic cells which don't possess internal membrane-bound organelles like mitochondria um, have this process of glycolysis uh, with which they re release energy from glucose. And prokaryotes have both glycolysis and also the subsequent stages of respiration which occur within the mitochondria, as we'll see in later lessons. And so glycolysis is common to all living organisms, prokaryotes and eukaryotes, and as such we can consider it to have evolved very early in the history of life on Earth. Now, the first atmosphere of the Earth consisted mainly of carbon dioxide and also some water vapour, traces of other gases such as methane and ammonia. Now, oxygen wasn't present, and so the atmosphere was anaerobic in nature. Now, by about 4 billion years ago, the very first forms of life uh, it, um, appeared on the Earth, and these were prokaryotic organisms. Now, we know this because if we examine rocks from um, periods of uh, time before that in Earth's history, so in other words, if we look at rocks which are older than about 4 billion years old, we don't find any traces of fossils of these single-celled organisms, these very simple uh, organisms in those rocks. No fossils can be found in rocks which are earlier or uh, which are geologically dated to being um, older than 4 billion years old. Now, once you go past about 4 billion years, you find rocks which contain these very simple early ancestors of uh, the prokaryotes. Now, these very early organisms, they were all unicellular chemoautotrophs and the ancestors of the modern bacteria. Now, these first organisms used carbon dioxide as a source of carbon and then oxidized inorganic materials to extract energy. Now, again, if you want some more detail on that, you can look back in to the first lesson uh, in this topic on the subject of autotrophs and heterotrophs, where we looked at chemoautotrophic bacteria in a little bit more detail. Now, the later prokaryotes, bacteria and archaea, evolved the process of glycolysis, uh, which is a set of chemical reactions that anaerobically uh, releases the energy in organic molecules such as glucose, storing that energy in the chemical bonds within the molecule ATP, or adenosine triphosphate. Now, if we fast forward to about 1.5 billion years ago, prokaryotic cells which are related to the archaea entered into an endosymbiotic association with ancient bacteria to form the ancestral eukaryotes. Now this goes back to um, what we were talking about in the topic on cells where we looked at the idea of the um, uh, endosymbiont hypothesis. In other words, the fact that uh, organ organelles such as chloroplasts and mitochondria may well have been originally free-living prokaryotic organisms, which entered into an endosymbiotic relationship with the ancestors of early eukaryotes. They became incorporated into the within the cells of the early pro eukaryotes, and rather than being broken down and digested, they released usable energy in the form of ATP for those eukaryotes to use, and in turn the host organisms provided shelter from the external conditions. Once again, if you want any more detail on that, I suggest that you go to the website invisible-college.com and go to the first, uh, or rather the second topic in the Advanced Level Biology uh, course module entitled Cells.
So uh, glycolysis, we can think of glycolysis as having evolved as a common metabolic process in both eukaryotes and prokaryotes. Again, uh, prokaryotes, which do not have internal membrane bound organelles, uh, do have this process of glycolysis taking place in their cytoplasms. So glycolysis itself is anaerobic. It does not require oxygen, but it can function in both aerobic or anaerobic environments. So the two major types of glucose catabolism, the breakdown of glucose, uh, are anaerobic fermentation, in which glucose is partially broken down, and also aerobic respiration, in which glucose is completely broken down. Now this scheme that you're looking at here gives you an overview of the various processes that we're going to be talking about relating to respiration uh, in this lesson and the following two lessons. So in this lesson we're going to focus specifically on the first stage of respiration which is called glycolysis and as you can see here this involves the breaking down of glucose to a substance called pyruvic acid and in so doing releases ATP, in other words releases usable energy. Uh, that pyruvic acid is then converted into acetyl-CoA in uh, a reaction that we call the link reaction uh, and later on we're also going to talk about uh, Krebs cycle um, and also the electron transport chain which are the subsequent parts of respiration. So everything from glycolysis onwards can be referred to as the aerobic part of respiration and therefore these processes requiring oxygen only can take place in an aerobic environment. Now whether or not you have oxygen available or not glycolysis can happen either way and so this is why we say that glycolysis even though itself it's an anaerobic process it can occur in organisms under aerobic or anaerobic conditions because it does not require oxygen. Now the other side of this diagram uh, is the uh, another related process uh, which is referred to as anaerobic fermentation which takes place for example in plants but also um, it, a, a corollary and analogous process takes place in animals where under anaerobic conditions, as you know from uh, GCSE biology, um, uh, our cells such as our own can respire under anaerobic conditions, but in so doing, they produce a byproduct called lactic acid. So we're going to be examining uh, these later stages of respiration in more depth in the following lessons after this one. So glycolysis is a precursor to both anaerobic fermentation that we see here on the right of this diagram, and also uh, to the aerobic parts of respiration that we see here on the left. And it is a precursor because it produces pyruvic acid or pyruvate, which can then be utilized as a substrate for each of these different kinds of processes, aerobic and anaerobic fermentation. So ATP, adenosine triphosphate, again this is a molecule that we encountered in the very first topic in the advanced level biology course uh, on the subject of biochemistry and molecular biology. ATP is generated by all of these processes, processes 1, 2 and 3 that are uh, labelled here. Um, so these are the processes that we refer to as glycolysis in the case of process 1. Process 2 is Krebs cycle and process three is what's referred to as the electron transport chain. Again, we're going to be looking at these other processes in a bit more depth. Now, the Krebs cycle, the electron transport chain, and also chemiosmosis, which is uh, an associated process uh, within the membranes of the mitochondria, which happens kind of in association with the electron transport chain reactions. Um, all of these processes uh, will be covered later on but uh, it is worthwhile mentioning, mentioning these here because it's important to understand that even though we kind of break uh, the process of respiration down into these stages, uh, that's essentially for the benefit of students and also for the benefit of teachers so that we can teach and learn about it uh, in a more kind of structured way. So later on, we're going to be looking at Krebs cycle, the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis in a bit more detail. But for now, we're just gonna focus on the biochemistry of glycolysis. So we've mentioned ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Now again, we covered this in a previous lesson on bio, uh, biochemistry and molecular biology, but it's important to uh, kind of have a little uh, look at it right now in this context. So ATP is always formed when a chemical biochemical reaction releases sufficient energy to bond a third phosphate group to adenosine diphosphate. So we start with adenosine diphosphate, we bond an additional phosphate group. Adenosine diphosphate is a molecule which contains 
two phosphate groups. By bonding this additional inorganic phosphate group to this molecule, we store energy in that terminal phosphodiester bond when we make ATP. So this reaction, as you can see here from this double-headed arrow, is actually reversible. So once we've stored the energy in the ATP, we can then release that energy to power biochemical processes in cells um, by hydrolyzing that bond uh, which linked this terminal phosph uh, phosphate group. So the production of ATP, the, uh, the reaction in the forward direction going from left to right, this reaction is catalyzed by an enzyme called ATP synthase. Now ATP is often referred to as the main energy currency for the cell, and it also acts as a store of useful energy. Now, when there's, whenever there's a demand for energy within cells, the ATP will be broken down into ADP and inorganic phosphate. Now, in doing that, we release useful energy. And in this direction, going from right to left, the reaction is catalyzed by a different enzyme, ATP hydrolase. So ATP is synthesized by a condensation reaction in which ADP combines with inorganic phosphate. Now this, again, because it's a condensation reaction, this produces a molecule of water. Now this reaction, again, is catalyzed by ATP synthase. So to illustrate, we, we have here a molecule of adenosine diphosphate. Now the term adenosine refers to the nitrogenous base adenine, which is found in DNA, for example. Um, this nitrogenous base is, is uh, chemically bonded to a ribose sugar, and this makes adenosine. Now, adenosine diphosphate is simply this molecule, adenosine, uh, linked to two phosphate groups by two phosphodiester bonds. So we then chemically bond to this a molecule of inorganic phosphate. Now, inorganic phosphate is the ion PO4 with three negative charges in aqueous solution. Now, in order to make this third, or the, rather this um, terminal phosphodiester bond here, we need to add energy to this molecule. So with the input of energy, we can then bond that inorganic phosphate to the ADP to make ATP. And again, this is catalyzed by ATP synthase. Now, because this is a condensation reaction, as with all condensation reactions that we saw in the topic on biochemistry and molecular biology, this produces a molecule of water. So the net formation of ATP occurs during both aerobic and anaerobic phases of respiration. But as we've seen in the previous lessons uh, of this topic, especially the second lesson where we looked at the biochemistry of photosynthesis, the production of ATP also happens whenever you have a net output of energy during the light dependent stage of photosynthesis as well. So glycolysis usually occurs within the cell cytosol of all life forms. So glycolysis is considered to be an ancient anaerobic metabolic process by which a glucose molecule is converted into two molecules of pyruvate. Now it's very important in both this lesson and the subsequent lessons where we look at the details of the stages of respiration that you keep a close eye on the relative numbers of all of these intermediate molecules and intermediate substances um, relative to the number of glucose molecules going into the process. As we'll see later on, one molecule of glucose ultimately gets broken down to two molecules of pyruvate or pyruvic acid. So this phase is referred to as glycolysis, uh, sorry, glyco glycolysis, and this results in the net production of two molecules of ATP directly. It also results in the production of two reduced NAD molecules, NADH molecules, and also two protons, two hydrogen ions. Now, under anaerobic conditions, when oxygen is not available in uh, in eukaryotic cells, for example, um, the pyruvate can then be further converted into either ethanol in the case of plants, for example, or lactate in the case of animal cells. And this is seen in alcoholic and lact lactic acid fermentations. So glycolysis is also uh, a major pathway for anaerobic respiration in this sense as well. So under aerobic conditions, however, um, the pyruvate is uh, enters via a link reaction into what's called the Krebs cycle. So the Krebs, Krebs cycle, as we'll see later on, yields two molecules of ATP directly per original glucose molecule that went into glycolysis.
Now, in addition to all of this, you also have a series of reactions which is referred to collectively as the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. Now, it's in fact those reactions that produces the vast majority of the ATP output of respiration as a whole. So, under aerobic conditions, the total number of ATP molecules produced per glucose molecule in um, in eukaryotic cells is 38 ATP per glucose molecule. And again, that's under conditions where oxygen is available. Now of that 38 molecules of ATP, 34 of those molecules are produced uh, during the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation reactions. Now the numbers that we're dealing with here um, I mean, this, this process is rather complicated. It gets a bit more complicated than this. But in A-level biology, we, uh, regardless of how complicated it may appear, we are essentially sim sim uh, simplifying uh, the process. Um, the numbers which I quote uh, in terms of numbers of ATP molecules produced in uh, in uh, glycolysis and in the electron transport chain, for example, these are approximations. Uh, but for the purposes of A-level biology, uh, the numbers uh, that, we're, that we're using here are perfectly acceptable. So overall, uh, one glucose molecule under conditions of aerobic respiration through glycolysis, through uh, the uh, citric acid, uh, the um, Krebs cycle and the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation, in total, one glucose molecule will yield 38 molecules of ATP on average. And 34 of those, as we'll see, come from the final stages of respiration, the electron transport chain and oxidative phosphorylation. So we've looked at an overview of glycolysis. Let's now start to look at the details uh, of glycolysis. Now, again, to remind you, a glucose molecule uh, has the molecular formula C6H12O6. And so we are looking at a, pati uh, a particular isomer of glucose uh, in a Howarth projection, uh, as you can see here. Now, again, if you want more details of Howarth projections and the isomers of glucose, I would suggest going back to the topic on biochemistry and molecular biology, which is the very first topic uh, of this advanced level biology course. Uh, we go into those in a lot more detail there on the subject of carbohydrates, on the lesson on carbohydrates. Now, obviously, um, this is uh, one representation of the structure of the glucose molecule. When we simply represent it at C as C6H12O6, it doesn't really give us very much information about the structure of the molecule. Now, in the discussion that follows, we're going to simplify the structure of a glucose molecule and represent it simply as a diagram which shows the number of carbon atoms which are bonded together. And so rather than represent it like this, we're going to use a more simple representation like this. So the very first stage of glycolysis is the stage where glucose is primed with energy. And so we can say that glucose is primed with energy, it is energized or activated, and this is done by hydrolyzing an ATP molecule and using the energy released from that hydrolysis of the ATP molecule to transfer uh, the energy to carbon-6 of the glucose molecule. Now in the Howarth projection, carbon-6 is this carbon here. So uh, when we do this, essentially what we're doing is phosphorylating the sixth carbon by adding a phosphate group. So this is the stage of uh, the very first step in the, in the process of glycolysis where we add a phosphate group to the end of the glucose molecule. Now in doing this, we are raising the uh, chemical potential energy of this molecule to a higher level. And so this phosphorylation reaction uh, we can say activates the glucose molecule, and the product is glucose 6-phosphate. Now, the glucose 6-phosphate uh, is, uh, um, is the kind of chemical naming or nomenclature which refers to the fact that we've added a phosphate group to the sixth carbon of the glucose molecule, and hence we've gone from glucose to glucose 6-phosphate. And this is the very first reaction in the sequence of reactions of glycolysis. So at this point, the glucose molecule actually re requires further activation because the whole idea here is to raise the chemical potential energy of the glucose molecule to the point where it then splits apart, as we'll see. So the glucose molecule requires further activation before that happens, and this occurs at the expense of yet another ATP molecule. And so what happens is that the glucose 6-phosphate 
needs to first be rearranged, as we see here, from glucose 6-phosphate to fructose 6-phosphate. Now, fructose is, again, a monosaccharide. It is a single sugar unit. But as you can see here, we have changed the structure of the glucose 6-phosphate molecule and rearranged it so that we're not dealing with a six-membered ring here. We're now dealing with a five-membered ring. We still have six carbons, but now this is the position of carbon 1, carbon 2, carbon 3, carbon 4, carbon 5, and carbon 6. So the glucose 6-phosphate first has to be rearranged into fructose 6-phosphate, and it's at this point that we can then uh, activate this molecule further by adding additional energy to the molecule. So this reaction is referred to as an isomerization reaction uh, because essentially we're dealing with two molecules with the same atoms in them of each element but with different uh, connectivity between those atoms by chemical bonds. So the original glucose molecule is now in the form of fructose 6-phosphate, which is again a hexose phosphate, but a hexose phosphate containing a five-membered ring rather than a six-membered ring. So carbon-1 and carbon-6, as you can see here, are now located outside of the ring. Both of them are located outside of the ring, whereas in glucose 6-phosphate, carbon-1 is part of the six-membered ring, as you can see here. So now we can activate this molecule further by again adding another phosphate group. And again, to do this, we need to hydrolyze an ATP molecule to release an inorganic phosphate and also to release energy, which can then be used to form that additional bond to a phosphate molecule. So a phosphate group can now be transferred from another ATP molecule to carbon-1, and this, uh, th this causes the molecule to become further activated. So again, we add another ATP molecule, and in so doing, we both raise the chemical potential energy of this molecule to a higher level and also uh, add an additional phosphate group. So what we've formed now is a new molecule referred to as fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. Again, for those of you who don't do uh, perhaps chemistry at an advanced level, this 1,6 refers to the fact that both of these two phosphate groups, again, bisphosphate here means two phosphate groups, both of these two phosphate groups are located on carbon-1 of this 6-carbon chain and carbon-6 of the 6-carbon chain. So this molecule, fructose 1,6-phosphate, is now sufficiently activated. The molecule is at a sufficiently high chemical potential energy level to spontaneously break down into two separate molecules which are at a lower potential energy state. So the conversion of glucose to fructose 1,6-diphosphate, uh, or bisphosphate as it's sometimes called, activates the glucose and in, uh, in total, as we've seen, utilizes two ATP molecules. Now at this point it's worthwhile pointing out that even though the overall process of um, respiration uh, produces a, a net production of 38 molecules of ATP in total under aerobic conditions, this is the net production. As we'll see later on, and as we've seen so far, ATP molecules are actually hydrolyzed along the way between glucose and the final products, carbon dioxide and water. But the point is that more ATP molecules are uh, produced as an output of the overall process than are consumed by the process. Now, so far, we've looked at the first couple of stages of glycolysis. And so far we haven't produced any output of ATP, we've consumed two molecules of ATP in activating glucose, first to, glu uh, to uh, glucose 6-phosphate and then to fructose 6-phosphate and then to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So we started with glucose, we have phosphorylated glucose with the use of one ATP molecule to make glucose 6-phosphate. Following that, we have isomerized glucose 6-phosphate to form fructose 6-phosphate, and then we have further activated the fructose 6-phosphate by phosphorylation, again using an another molecule of ATP to form fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So the conversion of glucose all the way to fructose 1,6-bisphosphate makes use of two ATP molecules. Now, 
the, the phosphorylation, the addition of phosphate groups to any substrate molecule is called substrate phosphorylation. And sometimes this is referred to as substrate level phosphorylation. Now, this is a phrase that you're going to see used both in the context of respiration and also in many other biochemical reactions. So just remember, whenever you see this phrase, uh, substrate phosphorylation or substrate level phosphorylation, it's referring to the addition of phosph uh, phosphate groups to any substrate molecule. So uh, at this point, we have a molecule, fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, which is so high in potential energy that it's essentially unstable and then breaks down. So we say that cleavage of the fructose 1,6-bisphosphate now occurs. So this splits into two molecules of three carbon sugars. Now, a three carbon sugar is referred to as a triose phosphate. Again, fructose is a six carbon sugar. It is a hexose sugar. And so fructose 1,6 one, one bisphosphate is a phosphorylated six carbon sugar. Now, if this splits equally in two, we can expect to produce two three carbon sugars, each of which are phosphorylated. So again, going back to that simplified a uh, diagrammatic way of representing these molecules, we start with a molecule of fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. The red uh, circles here represent the six carbon atoms, and the two yellow circles represent the two phosphate groups. This then splits, or cleaves, uh, in the middle to produce three, uh, two molecules of three carbon sugars, each of which has one phosphate group. So now each triose phosphate molecule is now converted into pyruvic acid or pyruvate by a series of steps. So we start with two molecules of triose phosphate. These are then converted into two molecules of phosphoglycerate. Now this step is an oxidation and involves the removal of two hydrogen atoms from each triose phosphate molecule. And so in doing this step, we are oxidizing these in the sense that we are removing hydrogen atoms from them. Now again, uh, this is something that I, I, you know, I need to reiterate many, many times, but at GCSE level, excuse me, <laughs> my voice is still recovering from a cold, I apologize. At GCSE level, you would have been taught the idea that oxidation uh, is defined as the loss of electrons or the uh, or, and reduction is the gain of electrons. Before GCSE level, you may have referred to oxidation as the gain of oxygen um, and, uh, or, uh, and reduction as the loss of oxygen. Now, both of those definitions are correct. They just involve different um, additions or removals of different kinds of particles. So oxidation can be uh, can, uh, can be used to refer to either the loss of electrons or the gain of oxygen atoms. Now, at advanced level, both in chemistry and biology, you need to be aware of a third definition for oxidation and reduction. The loss of hydrogen atoms from a particle or a molecule is referred to as oxidation, and the gain of hydrogen atoms by a molecule or by a particle is referred to as reduction. So here we are uh, referring to the fact that each of these triose phosphate molecules has been oxidized because in turning the triose phosphate molecules into phosphoglycerate molecules, we have removed hydrogen atoms from them. Two hydrogen atoms are removed from each of these triose phosphate molecules to form phosphoglycerate molecules. Now, in order to do, uh, to do this reaction, we also actually form molecules of ATP in the process because these rea uh, this reaction is exergonic. It is, uh, it is a reaction that produces a net output of energy. And in so doing, we can then use that energy to form ATP from ADP. And so because we are converting two molecules of triose phosphate to two molecules of phosphoglycerate, we also produce two molecules of ATP in this process. Now, at this point, the phosphoglycerate molecules are then converted into pyruvic acid. Now, pyruvic acid is the term for the molecule itself. When that molecule is in aqueous solution, it dissociates to form uh, an, an ion called the pyruvate ion. And so often you will see biologists refer to pyruvic acid and pyruvate interchangeably. So glycerate phosphate uh, or phosphoglycerate is converted into pyruvate and this involves the release of sufficient energy to form yet another molecule of ATP per molecule which is converted. So again, here we have another process which uh, which releases sufficient energy to form 
another molecule of ATP. And because we're doing this process for two molecules of phosphoglycerate to form two molecules of pyruvic acid, we produce two molecules of ATP. Now, the two hydrogen atoms which are uh, produced by the oxidation of the two molecules of triose phosphate are then accepted by a molecule of a hydrogen carrier called NAD, and this then forms NADH2. So this is reduced NAD. Now, due to the prevailing pH, the NADH2 then dissociates to form NADH and H+. So, uh, this is the overall scheme by which triose phosphate is converted by two steps into pyruvic acid. So, let's quickly summarize what we've talked about so far in glycolysis. So, one molecule of glucose is first primed with energy to form uh, first fr uh, uh, glucose 6-phosphate. It is then isomerized to form fructose 6-phosphate, and then that fructose 6-phosphate is further primed with more energy and also phosphorylated again to form fructose 1,6-bisphosphate. So overall, that stage utilizes two molecules of ATP in total. At that point, you have fructose 1,6-bisphosphate, which is a uh, high in chemical potential energy and is therefore unstable and spontaneously breaks down to form two molecules of triose phosphate. Each triose phosphate molecule then gets oxidized ultimately to form a single molecule of pyruvic acid or pyruvate and that stage generates in total as we saw in the previous slide four molecules of ATP. So the net gain of ATP from glycolysis in total if two molecules of ATP go in per molecule of glucose, and in total two mo uh, four molecules of ATP are produced per molecule of glucose in going from one molecule of glucose to two molecules of pyruvate, then the net production of ATP by glycolysis is two molecules of ATP per molecule of glucose. Now, in addition to that, it's really important to remember that two molecules of reduced hydrogen carriers, two molecules of NADH, and also two hydrogen ions are produced as well in total. Now, I'd like you all to make sure that you bear these totals in mind because we're going to go into the next stages of glycolysis in subsequent lessons. And when we reach the end of this section of this topic, uh, we're going to do a summary of the overall process of respiration, uh, both glycolysis and also the aerobic phases of respiration, the Krebs cycle, the electron transport chain, and summarize where all of those 38 ATPs come from. And in, in so doing, it's really important that you keep track not just of the um, intermediate molecules that are being produced and the numbers of those which are produced per molecule of glucose, not just the total numbers of ATP molecules that go in and come out of that process, uh, but also the molecules of these reduced hydrogen carriers which are produced and the hydrogen ions as well. Because as we'll see in the uh, next couple of lessons, these are also very important in the overall production of ATP in the later stages of respiration. Okay, everyone, that's going to do it for this lesson. And I will see you in the next lesson where we continue our discussion of respiration.